Um, Julian Cope had been a guy that we noticed around the Eric scene. He was sort of not quite a nobody, but not quite one of the main guys. But he was very talkative and friendly, and you'd get to you just find yourself chatting to him a lot. And we'd uh, and he'd announced that he'd had this new band, and we were thinking, well, we've got to do something after this big in Japan's posthumous EP. And so he said he was doing a gig and we went to the gig and we thought it sounded pretty good. Um, and we said, okay, let's do it. And um, kind of got involved with the band in general. And I, I can't remember how exactly we zeroed in on Sleeping Gas as being the A side. And I think we did two B sides. And I recorded it in a, a, a four track EP that I'd learned how to do in a four track studio that I'd learned how to do um, operate just a week or two earlier. Um, and Again, it was just flying by the seat of your pants. You'd literally learn by doing it. Okay, how do we do a sleeve? What do we have to have on the sleeve? Why do we do a sleeve? Who's going to do the artwork for the sleeve? Oh, I know a guy who can do the artwork for the sleeve. Um, we'd get him to do it. He'd do a bit of artwork. Oh, is that what artwork looks like? And take it over to the printing paper. you get it done. you go, how much is it going to cost? How many should we do? And so we just do it all. And then where do you go to sell them? How do you sell independent singles? We, could we go into shops? We, and we, you just find it, and you nearly always find somebody who knew somebody who'd tell you what to do, and you just do it. And it's really strange, you know, in a way that you'd never think of doing now. Well, I wouldn't think. You'd think of making a big plan and reviewing it all in advance and talking to all the kind of people and working out what kind of money and what kind of money you're going to need before you start off and how big a risk it is. Again, I think this is more Bill's influence. Bill is a doer. Bill just says, right, we're going to do this, and just does it in a way that nobody else I know uh, does. And uh, he said, right, we're going to do this. And, and I'd be going, OK, but I can record it. And go, right, go and record it. And um, so I'd go and record it. And I'd never recorded anything before. I literally, ne I, can't, I produced that, although the band objected to me getting the production credit. I produced Sleeping Gas EP, and I'd not even recorded a note of another band before I did that. I'd just been taught in an hour to, how to, to operate the equipment. I did it twice just to uh, work out how to do it, because I thought it was a bit rough the first time. Um, and I think, uh, looking back, I'd recommend to lots of people to do things that way. Somehow you operate in a very different mode that is far more creative and far more open and than a kind of sitting back and reviewing all the options and making sure you're taking the right risks and thinking very hard. Unfortunately, I've become a person who does all those things, who thinks very hard about everything and makes a plan and reviews, am I doing it right? Could I do it this way? Could I do it that way? But in those days, I, we, we just did it. The only person from another label that we knew at all was Tony Wilson, and we didn't know him that well. I mean, we'd have a conversation with him. Later on, we'd have a bigger conversation with him, and he was a very, very friendly guy. Um, but you've got to remember, he was a famous person in Merseyside and Manchester and Liverpool because he was on the telly all the time. He'd had a sort of new wave come punk um, late night music show. And he was also, when I first come across him, he was just one of these guys who has each region, and this was Granada, had that sort of post-news, 6.30ish magazine program. And he'd have a slot called What's On, and it would be what comedians or record or bands or something. And he, he was determinedly in with the, what the coming stuff was. Rather than showing the latest mega band playing the big theatre, he'd be telling you about Buzzcocks or Warsaw, who was what led up to Joy Division. Or, so... He was this big guy from the telly who wore suits and stuff like that. And, and so when he turned up at Eric's and you'd see him, you'd be quite daring to go over and talk to him. But later on, when they had Joy Division, we had the Tear Ups and Bunny Men and we were doing quite well. And we did a, festi a little mini festival together. Um, and we played with Joy Division quite a lot. And we played over at the factory club before they even had the Hacienda opened. They had this, they'd taken over some old club and called it the factory. We played there quite a few times with the Bunny Man and the Teardrops. And um, so we got, but, but Bob last, I think I bumped into a couple of years later, you know, when he was out with the Human League um, and um, various others. You just didn't meet him. You were just busy getting on with your own thing. 
you kind of had, there was this supposed, I mean, I was always very suspicious at the time that you, ha you always have a kind of the dogma of the age, the, 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 the ethos that's supposed to be what you're all about, which is do it yourself and being against a big corporate man. And certainly I think there are others who believed in that, but I was always very suspicious of this bandwagon jumping of today, you know, this year's set of guidelines, of ethical guidelines, and this is what you're supposed to get worked up about. And I, I, there was a certain amount of that going on, but essentially I kind of thought that we were just trying to be as good as a big record company. And because, again, nearly all the great records I'd ever heard had come from big record companies, the Beatles, the Stones, the Doors, okay, the Doors were from, uh, but um, David Bowie was on a very big record company and they made fantastic records and nearly every band that you'd loved had come from big record companies. So I had nothing against big record companies. Um, I didn't even think about capitalism then. I just thought about how the hell are we going to make a, a next record that doesn't bankrupt us and to make it good and make the band play to a bigger audience. In those days, you would you'd do a gig in Liverpool and you'd play to a hundred people and you'd try and set it up so the next time you played you'd be playing to 200 people and the next time you played you played to 300 people and, and, and then you'd go to Manchester and you'd pay to 75 people but you'd try and make it so you were doubling that next time you went and, and that was all you were trying to do and get on the third on the bill and some gig in London and hope that there was 75 people in the audience to see you because you were third on the bill um, at a thousand capacity venue and we'd be doing things like that and um, so you were just desperately trying to figure out what's the next step we should be taking. We've got this offer, we could do that, what should we do? And muddle on through. There wasn't a time for an ethos or an ethic or a political position on it. Um, um, Kopi formed a band at one point called the Nova Mob that was dedicated to being, to trying to get Big in Japan to pack it in. That, I don't think they did anything else. I've still got a t-shirt, that's a Nova Mob t-shirt, some things that they printed up individually um, and they had all kinds of things and they tell me about it all after the event but it was more stuff that they'd come up with in their own bedrooms and over a cup of tea and they'd rarely do a gig I don't even know if a shallow madness did a gig but there was the crucial three most famously which was Wiley Mac and Julian but again I don't think they in fact I'm pretty sure they never did a gig and that was what I suspect they would have carried on doing for a year or two if, if Zoo hadn't come along um, it might never have, and we suddenly happened to pop up and say, okay, this month's incarnation, we're going to take it and make, keep it going and make it get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Because of the slightly weird way that I stepped in to, to, to fill in when the, Paul Simpson, the original keyboard player, left, and although there was a brief period when another guy, uh, Jed Quinn, came in on keyboards and then I kind of angled them out because I decided I'd like being in the theatre a bit more and wanted to carry on playing with them. Um, and I was in a, for most of four years, um, on and off. So it, it was really strange that we were the record label and we were the producers and they were the, uh, the managers, Bill and I, but I was also in the band. And so it did start becoming that the bunny man was much more bills because it became stranger and stranger for me to turn up at a bunny man meeting as their manager when I was the keyboard player for the Theatre Explodes. And although they started off very, very close together, and we'd done most of the first dozen gigs, I think, were the two bands together. The bunny man had put a single out a few months after the teardrops, so we're kind of perceived as a little bit behind the teardrops in, in size, were very miffed to be constantly the support act. But in those days, they didn't have enough equipment between the two bands to do two gigs on the same night in different places. They were mainly using a lot of my equipment, and I think there was one drum kit between them all, I, I, although the Bunny Man didn't have a drum kit, a, a drummer at the original. So um, after a while, the Bunny Man put their foot down and said they weren't doing any more gigs with the teardrops. And that, I think, was the beginning of a slight divergence. Suddenly it went from being all mates in this wild, wacky new adventure together, isn't this amazing, to, hang on, you're our main competition now. Um, and then with that happening, and it wasn't a big deal or a big thing, but it was definitely an undercurrent that was getting bigger. 
that it became weirder for me to suddenly turn up at, in a, a, at a bunny man meeting and start pontificating on what they ought to be doing when I was the keyboard player for the teardrops. But for many, for a while, Bill was equally managing both. Um, but then tensions kind of just, again, in that manner that I was talking about earlier that led to Mick going, suddenly you just go through a little bad patch and between Julian and Bill. And I'm not really sure why that happened. I think Julian perceived Bill as more of a, the bunny men's manager. And I think felt a bit disgruntled about that. And, and Bill, and, and they just drifted apart and suddenly it, that snapped and I was left on one side, hardly dealing with the bunny man. Apart from when I bump into him socially and we were all friendly, but just feeling a bit, you know, if you're off touring for a month with the teardrops, you can't suddenly turn up and pick up and you haven't been in the last half a dozen meetings with the bunny man. Um, and so Bill was doing that all fine. So um, that was the way it went, really. Well, strangely, we, we did very well from the beginning. We, we, we got good reviews. I think we were, the Sleeping Cast was Single of the Week in Sounds and maybe Melody Maker as well. And we kept on getting really good singles reviews for these and amazed us. And, you know, we'd cobbled together Sleeping Cast. With the better, you know, it's hard to see it for what it is, but it sounded to me like a very arty record, a very weird record. I couldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> on many levels, it is just going. Everybody seems, to, but that's often the way. Sometimes you just do stuff instinctually, and it's the right thing to do. Your instincts are right. You've been in the right places. You picked, soaked up the right spirit of the times, right, and you've got a, a combination of a whole lot of things, and and you just do the right thing without any great knowledge or design. And I think that's what happened. And we we did we got quite a lot of singles of the weeks and good reviews for the first few releases we did. Um, and I think it helps being the underdogs as well. I think if we'd have been some new signing to Warners or CBS or something, they might have judged us in a slightly more harsh way. But being seen as just these nobodies from on a nobody label, you know, genuine do-it-yourself alternative people, I think people saw it in that context and were more prepared to find something more artistically interesting in it rather than just wanting a great big pop wow moment. Yeah, Bill and I, especially me, don't like to do the boring organising stuff and we thought why not get an office and get a young lady in and she can do all the boring stuff and, uh, and we can go off and do the fun stuff. And so we got in a, a lady called Pam Young that I'd met at some gig in, from Sheffield and persuaded to come over to Liverpool. I don't know why, I like the look of her. Um, and we got an office and we didn't really need an office. It was a bit of an unnecessary expense. And it just drove me mad because it just made the bunny men and teardrops hang out in town in our office. And it just became a hangout place. And which seemed to me to defeat the whole purpose of it, but probably was a good idea. Um, so, but basically, we just potted on. Uh, uh, you just, Bill would have a big notebook with a big list and he'd just keep copy, uh, crossing things out as they were accomplished. And that's how you do it. I, keep, I still say to people now, if you really want to do something, you need one piece of technology. And that's a pen and a paper and, or book, notebook, and lists, list, 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 all the things you need to do. And then just risk them, do them and cross them off. It's a brilliant way of working. Um, before we get onto that, I'm, I'm going to talk about Treason, because Treason was um, the third teardrop single, and we, we roped in Clive Langer, who Bill knew, who has been the guitarist and kind of creative leader of Deaf School and from Liverpool. And by then, I think he just had hit with producing Madness. And we asked him to produce the next Teardrop single. And we had this song that we thought was pretty good cool, called cool, Treason. And we got him in. And, um, and he did a great job with it. Um, and it suddenly sounded like a massive leap forward. I, I still think today it sounds like a, a glorious bit of pop. Um, and, um, and that came out. And again, it got really good reviews. But we, we put that out ourselves. That was kind of, I think, might be the last 
single that we put out as an independent record label. Um, before we signed Burning Man and the Teardrops to, to Majors. Um, and that was, that's a great thing. I mean, it got re-released after Reward and got top 20. Uh, and it's a wonderful single. Um, and uh, uh, Clive did a great job. Uh, but um, later on, then the next single we did was When I Dream. And When I Dream, we got a guy who called Mike Howlett, who'd just done good stuff with Orchestra Maneuvers, I think. He'd had a hit with them and I think somebody else. I can't remember exactly who. And he did When I Dream. And When I Dream, we really thought we were on the verge of getting through there, but it got to number 42 or something like that. And we were all very disappointed with that. And I think it was just at that point that we decided that Mick left. And we, I think there was a really sticky time for the band because we really thought... Because, again, one of the things that, again, most people forget is that most bands, by this time, there was... You know, practically every month there seemed to be more indie labels springing up and more bands on indie labels in all the cities. And <clears throat> most of them, and there was this massive big divide, this yawning chasm between these bands who potted on, putting out singles, doing quite well, but never quite earning enough, and making the big time, earning enough to actually do it for a living. And the bands who suddenly would be on top of the pops. And that was the big divide. And we had to cross that divide. And one of the things about signing to a major record label is they're only interested in bands that cross that divide. And they thought we were those kind of bands. And we wanted to be those kind of bands. We didn't want to be a band that only some you know, anorak would remember us in 10 years' time. We wanted to be a band that had been on top of the pops, had been in the charts. And we wanted to be the Doors. We wanted to be the Beatles. We wanted to be the Stones. We wanted to be as big as we could get. Because you never really know how good you are until you give it a go. Um, but when our dream came out, and it, it just didn't, yeah, and we thought that was a really poppy, great song, and and then we were a, li a little bit of a loss. We we had this one mad song, which was reward, that that was we thought had something, but we really weren't sure. It was kind of mad. It was one riff with a kind of little melody that we, you know, it was just one riff, and that da 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 and da 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 da. da, da repeated ad nauseum and we said so we didn't really know what to think of it and we we went in with Clive to record it Clive Langer and and we thought it sounded pretty good and we got some great sounding trumpets and it was my idea to take the riff and just we put what we call the soul beat on it which is bump 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 and I said do those with trump with trumpets it'll sound great and we did that and it did sound great um but then we had, um, we did the first mix, really didn't work at all, that Clive Lang and Alan and Stanley, his producing partner, did. And Julian and I had a bit of an argument over it, and Julian decided to pack in the band, because um, I think he was sick of me. And I said, look, don't pack in the band. I'll leave and you can carry on without me. And I, I'd been the, the, although I was still technically the manager, Julian said, OK, and we did it. And we were all friendly and had hugs and everything afterwards. But, uh, um, and then Julian and, 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 sorry, I'll start again. That was me. I forgot to turn the sound off on my thing. 